Welcome everyone to Learn at Lunchtime today. I'm Sherry Trimble, one of your museum educators here. I'm gonna be guiding you guys through the discussion. I'm gonna be monitoring the Q&A box. So anytime during the program, please feel free to pop in those questions. I'm joined by two of my colleagues here at the State Museum, Bob Hill, who uh, is one of our history curators and he specializes in military and industrial history as well as Katie McGowan, also one of our history curators. And she specializes uh, in our community and domestic life. And they're coming from this topic from two different perspectives. So this is gonna be a great opportunity to hear two different angles of a very similar topic. So I'm gonna turn this over to Katie now. So the, our program today is titled Between Two Worlds. Mary Sharp Ward's Red Cross service from 1943 to 1945. And we wanted to start the program today by just introducing you to who um, Mary Frances Sharp was. Um, she donated a collection of artifacts related to her Red Cross service in World War II to the State Museum in 1987. And one of the unique things about this collection is that she actually gave us a draft of her master's thesis, which is essentially written like a memoir about her experiences as a Red Cross worker. Um, and it's kind of unusual for us to receive artifacts for which the story is essentially already written. So you'll be hearing a lot of Mary's own words and reflections from her time with the Red Cross throughout our presentation today. She was born in 1912 in Lock Haven. Um, she was the daughter of Frank Sharp and Ella Gartoff. And prior to uh, joining the Red Cross, she was actually a public school teacher. And she does tell us why she decided to join the Red Cross um, in her memoir. And I quote her here, to be honest, I will have to say it was for the sake of adventure. For myself, I had vague memories of the Red Cross girls in France in World War I, and I was an avid reader at the age of eight of all books about these glamorous girls. I also felt that I wanted to be where all the action was. Um, but it wasn't uh, easy to be selected for Red Cross service, so Bob is going to talk us through what the Red Cross application process entailed. Okay, thank you, Katie. So what did it take to become a Red Cross worker? Well, according to Mary's memoir, it took about a year to amass the needed information, special training, and passing a rugged physical examination. Then followed four days of intense interviews done by various professionals, including psychiatrists. We had to be at least 24 years old, college graduates, and actively successful in our professions. Most of all, we had to be able to immediately adjust to all situations and be resourceful and outgoing. At the end of four days of interviews, one out of 50 candidates was chosen. So overall, during the war, the Red Cross put 5,000 workers into overseas units, parceling them out at no more than five workers per unit. Of that 5,000, 86 were unfortunately killed, with over 50 of those being women. Katie? Um, Mary's service begins in North Africa in August of 1943. Bob, can you tell us what the significance was of the North African region during World War II? Yes, at the beginning of the war, Britain dominated the Mediterranean and controlled the strategic points that you see on the map circled in red, Gibraltar at the entrance of the Atlantic, Malta, the centrally located small island south of Sicily, and Suez where the canal connected to the Indian Ocean. All of these were vital points connecting to Britain's overseas territories. Italy entered the war in June 1940 and was already in Libya. A seesaw campaign developed between the Italians in Libya and the British in Egypt and developed uh, with additional forces being brought in by the Germans to reinforce the Italians and then additional British forces sent in response. 
the big picture in 1941 was that Hitler invaded the Soviet Union. And by the end of the year, the United States entered the war after the attack on Pearl Harbor. So in 1942, Soviet Premier Stalin was pressuring President Roosevelt and British Prime Minister Churchill for a second front to drive the Germans and divide their forces in two directions. In response, US and the British allies invaded Morocco and Algeria in November of 1942 to get behind the Germans and Italians in North Africa. So the Germans and Italians were now caught between the existing British army in Egypt moving west and the newly arrived invasion forces moving east. They surrendered in May of 1943. And Mary noted in her memoir of seeing dejected Africa Corps soldiers awaiting transport to POW camps in the United States. Katie? When Mary arrives in Algeria, they set up a camp there. And Algeria for her was really a holding place um, where they could receive training. Um, they participated in drills and they just became acclimated to kind of camp life. Um, Mary was assigned to the Red Cross Hospital and Recreation Corps that had been established in 1918. And its specific function was to provide non-medical support to the hospital units. Um, so for example, she kind of describes her role as being one of boosting morale for patients that were um, kept at the hospital for several months at a time. They would often write, help them write letters, they would read to them. And an integral part of this was um, setting up carpenter and craft shops for them to have things to do while they recovered. Uh, the standard issue uniform that she wore um, for the hospital recreation service was this gray seersucker dress. And in fact, a lot of the workers who participated in this way were referred to as the gray ladies. And I, um, a quote that I pulled out of her memoir while she's in this North Africa region was, it was a life stripped of pretense and unessentials. We were needed and we were content. After North Africa, Mary's group is sent to Italy between October of 1943 to September of 1944. Um, the tone of her memoir here changes from that of kind of wonder and excitement at the exoticness of her surroundings to her struggling to find needed, needed supplies and the general weary attitudes of the patients. Bob, can you elaborate on what was happening during this part of the war? Sure, thank you. After the Germans and Italians had surrendered in North Africa, the next allied objective was to capture the Italian island of Sicily, which you see the red arrow pointing to the landing areas on that island, and use that as a stepping stone to Italy. Uh, they did this in July and August of 1943, and driving the German and Italian forces back onto the Italian peninsula. The Allies followed. Britain invaded Italy on September 3rd, which incidentally was the day that Mary arrives in Algiers. And the US invaded near Salerno, where you see the blue arrow, a few days later with the immediate objective of capturing the port city of Naples. The geography of the Italian peninsula favored the defenders with the Apennine mountains forming a north-south spine uh, and numerous rivers flowing from the mountains to the east and west. And the Germans used this terrain uh, to build a series of defensive lines uh, and the Allied offensive bogged down. At this point, uh, Mary is, catches up with the war uh, when the 36th General Hospital is located at Caserta near Naples, the blue circle on the map, uh, where it was badly needed uh, to treat the many casualties. Katie? 
I'm going to ask one quick question of the audience. Some uh, one person has commented they have no sound. Uh, if anybody, I'm hearing fine. Is anybody else having any issues? If so, please put it in the Q and A. Um, go ahead, Katie. See what happens. Sorry, um, I just have a photograph here of um, the hospital that Mary was stationed at in Italy. This is the Ospedale Militare in Caserta, Italy, which she describes in great detail in her memoir, um, especially the two foot long rats is one of the things that I remember from this section. Um, this is another one of her uniforms. Um, this was considered a summer uniform, cold weather clothing. Um, keep in mind, she is in Italy over the winter um, during this period. Um, cold weather clothing was not provided to the Red Cross workers, but they were allowed to purchase um, warmer clothes from supply depots. While she's in Italy, um, this is when she establishes her carpenter and craft shop. Um, she states that most of the men were to be at the hospital for at least three months at a time, and some sort of carpenter slash craft work was necessary for, for their sanity. Um, so we have here two examples of items in our collection that were made by um, convalescing soldiers. We have a bracelet made from aluminum. And if you have an eagle eye, you can see that there are initials MS for Mary Sharp on this bracelet. And we have here a plexiglass ring. Um, the cameo on this ring is actually cut from an English coin. Um, and Mary talks a lot about being able to, being able to and being not able to acquire supplies throughout her service. Um, she was not given supplies. She had to find them herself or pay for them herself. Their things were not issued to her. So really a lot of what we see with the artifacts that she gave us are kind of found materials. And she states in her memoir that the all time favorite materials were plexiglass from airplanes and 22 millimeter shell casings that were about nine inches long. She writes that I became a professional scrounger. Every supply officer for miles around knew me and some even shuddered when I approached begging for tools, especially hammers and hacksaws and blades. Um, I do know that she did have a driver that would take her around as she was gathering supplies. And there's kind of one memorable account of her climbing into a ditch where there had been a downed airplane and she um, proceeded to saw off uh, parts of that airplane for her use. Bob is now going to move us along into France. Okay, the map uh, that we have been using uh, to follow Mary's progress uh, actually dates from February of 1944. And you can see there by the, the color difference on the Italian peninsula, it shows that the allies had made little progress uh, in their advance north in Italy uh, at that time. By the beginning of June, however, the Germans abandoned their defensive lines south of Rome and the allies took the city. Two days later on the 6th, the allies landed in Normandy in Northern France where you see the red arrow. Uh, the Allied objective, of course, was to drive the Germans out of France. And so a secondary invasion was launched on August 15th, landing in the south of France, where you see the blue arrow. And this pushed the Germans north and east and eventually linked up with the Normandy invasion forces and continued to push east. Uh, at this time, the army moved the 36th General Hospital to Dijon, France, where you see the blue circle. On December 16th, the Germans counterattacked in what became known as the Battle of the Bulge. Mary remarked in her memoir about the increased number of casualties coming into the hospital at that time. After Thanksgiving, all hell broke loose. The army units at the front zigzagged back and forth. Our hospital unit was alerted that we could be captured as our unit was simply too big to move. Everyone in the unit worked at least 16 hours a day. 
we would crawl back to our quarters and fall into a stupor until early morning. Now, although the situation certainly was serious and caused great concern for Mary and her companions, the German attack was actually focused to the north with the objective of capturing the port city of Antwerp, Belgium, uh, in an effort to sever the Allied supply lines. So the Allies responded more effectively than the Germans had anticipated, and the attack failed. Katie? We have here a photograph of the 36 General Hospital's headquarters in Dijon, France, at the Le Cassin Junot. Um, one of the, the functions of Mary's work with the Red Cross was to kind of be that morale booster. So she writes that the Red Cross staff were the touch of home um, for the patients. We have here another one of her uniforms. This is considered a Red Cross winter uniform. Um, these were quite expensive. Typically the first issue was free, um, but Mary states that she did purchase this uh, suit at a cost of $150. And she purchased it in Dijon, France. Um, but it does include a maker's label on the inside. It was made by Smith Gray of New York. Um, and they actually had an army contract to produce uniforms for service members at this time. Keeping in mind that um, if she's paying $150 for this suit, she did state elsewhere that her annual stipend um, was only about $2,700. So it did, it did eat into a large chunk of her stipend. And most of her other funds, she says, were spent in order to acquire the supplies that she would then use in her shop. We have another item here, which is a bracelet made of plexiglass. Uh, you can see it says Paris on it. And the blue decoration on this bracelet comes from ink. Um, she does kind of show her resourcefulness many times throughout this memoir about absolutely using everything and anything that she could find. Um, and I really loved this quote um, from the memoir. In these terrible days before the Battle of the Bulge, that shop resounded with the mighty blows on the metal as the patients fashioned all sorts of articles from the casings. You could hear that shop a block away and it was worth being called names to see what sanity savers these shell cases were to the men. We have a few more artifacts here from our collection. We have a pair of wooden clogs that were painted um, and sent home as souvenirs and a knotted belt, knotted and woven belt. And then these interesting looking straw shoes were actually acquired according to her from a German depot. Um, Germany did make use of a lot of forced labor during the course of the war. And these shoes were utilized by those laborers as mud shoes. So they kind of raise you up off of the ground a bit um, so that your shoes would not get dirty. And Mary describes taking these shoes and ripping them apart and having soldiers fashion other materials out of them. So we did find this pretty incredible photo. This is actually from the 36th General Hospital. Um, and you can see soldiers here kind of weaving these placemat type things. And it's likely that those shoes were utilized in this way. So Bob is going to wrap up the war and transition us back home. Okay, by the spring of 1945, Germany was being crushed between the Allies moving from the West and the Soviet armies coming from the East. Uh, the Germans surrendered on effective May 8th, 1945. And two months later, Mary and the 36th moved from Dijon to Garage near Paris, the second blue circle that you see on the map, uh, where they treated both US soldiers and liberated prisoners of war from various countries until September when their unit began demobilization. They returned to the US in November of 1945. Katie? 
Yeah, so we have here a image of the ship manifest of Mary returning back to the United States, um, dated November 10th, 1945. She returned on the SS Volcania, and her transition home was um, not as smooth as one might expect. Uh, she, she writes, it would have been a little easier if we could have gathered as the men could at the American Legion and other service clubs. But those types of organizations weren't established in great numbers at the end of World War II, especially for women. Um, she also writes, it was so quiet at home, I had to enroll at the local state college. There is a day room with several hundred women screaming away so that I could sleep. I enrolled in a few classes, but found them so dull that I usually skip them. Um, so what happens to her after the war? Um, so she gets married to a gentleman named Frederick Ward in 1948. He is mentioned throughout her memoir because they actually met while abroad in service. He was a British citizen and a squadron leader with the RAF. Um, so it took about two years for them to be reunited after they were discharged. Um, she leaves out a few details, but they were engaged sometime in that interim. And then when he returned, they basically went straight to the wedding ceremony once he got off the boat. And they were married for about 25 years. She writes in her memoir about going back to teaching. So she first teaches first grade in Philadelphia and also says that she was a faculty member at Mansfield University around the time of her marriage. She also taught for many years um, with the Central Dauphin School District, specifically at E.H. Phillips Elementary School. And in 1984, she decided to go back to school and obtained her master's degree in American studies from Penn State Harrisburg. She did spend a number of years volunteering with the State Museum and she died in 1989. Um, so that is it for the presentation. And I think Sherry is going to bring us back for Q&A. Yeah, so if you wanna stop sharing your screen, Katie, then we'll see all of us on here. We do have a couple of questions. So um, this one actually brings up something that I actually put in the chat box. Um, so these items that we're seeing today, they are, they're asking the question, can you see them at the State Museum? Bob, you want to tackle that one? They are not currently on exhibit. We do have a public uh, aspect of our Argus cataloging system, and they are listed on there. Uh, maybe either you, Sherry, or, or Katie yep. can tell people how to get into that from the outside. I'm, I'm yep. used to always going in from the inside. So. Yeah, so the, um, the link um, that you see there in the chat box, and I'll actually share that in an email, so that can be uh, sent later uh, if you don't want to do it right now, uh, is the search collection for the State Museum. And will they just put in uh, her name? What should they put into the search box when they look up her name, Katie? They can actually type in Between Two Worlds, which is the title of this presentation, and all of the items that we showed today um, will appear together. All right. And I'll remind you that in the email so you're not like trying to remember that. Um, so uh, how about Mary's memoir? Um, is that digitized in any way, Katie? Um, so it, it should be available through Penn State Harrisburg's library. Um, since it, theses are usually considered publications, we don't have the opportunity to digitize it. But um, having been a graduate of that same place myself, I know that they do have printed copies of theses available in the library there. Okay. Um, here's my question. So back to the Red Cross, and this is supplying their uniforms. Was the federal government supposed to supply those items? Um, and was there just a lack of funding for the Red Cross? Um, from what I was seeing, uh, most of the Red Cross are considered like civilian volunteers, so they were expected to furnish themselves um, with uniforms, unlike with military service where they would typically be issued. Am I correct in saying that, Bob? Yes. I think that probably some of the uh, supply issues are usually part of military operations. And in this case, the 
the Red Cross, five people out of every unit would be wearing these different clothes. So it's that much more difficult to try to get the proper things to these areas. Now, what she experienced was the head nurse at the hospital uh, simply gave her some what would be considered GI uh, clothing, government issue, army. She has um, a tanker's jacket, uh, several uh, pairs of pants, uh, hats, that sort of thing readily discernible because they are in the typical military olive drab color instead of the the gray variants that you see with the Red Cross uniforms. You and you mentioned nurses. So nurses were part of the military and the difference of the Red Cross, did you see that and and kind of the jobs the Red Cross women had? They are act sort of as in auxiliary functions. Uh, Mary's uh, recreation uh, officer. There was also one who Mary quite literally calls the party girl. Uh, <laughs> that's that's what she does. She sets up uh, social events at, the, at these hospitals for patients who are ambulatory enough to be able to attend them. Uh, one also did uh, just uh, clerical work. So this this had the effect of freeing up the nursing staff, those with medical training to actually uh, perform the necessary medical functions for the patients. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. There was um, something in the memoir too about being part of the Red Cross allowed her kind of greater freedom of movement than some of the actual service members where she could walk a little bit more freely in the neighborhoods and the streets. Um, because Red Cross was an international organization, so it was well recognized. Um, so she did she did have a little bit of freedom there too. Um, so we're talking about women. Did you see any men as part of the Red Cross, or would they have just automatically gone into the military? I don't recall her mentioning any men. Uh, Katie, am I correct in that? The only people that I remember her referring to is like the the actual medical staff had a lot of men and they kept the doctors kind of secluded from action so that they were fresh and ready to help um, as as lots of patients were coming into the hospital but as far as like men that did the same work as her I didn't recall her mentioning that too often no I think more likely the the physical uh, requirements that she talked about in the beginning, if if a man would have met those, yeah, they would have been taken into the regular military. About the only exception I can think of might have been if they were over uh, over age for it, but still in relatively good health. But for the most a part, times, a few times she actually mentions recruiting patients who were able-bodied enough to help her set things up or to help her carry things. Um, so yes, that seems to indicate a lack of male helpers. Yeah, and including uh, male prisoners, uh, prisoners of war, particularly in France, uh, either participating, uh, the engraver uh, was an older German man who uh, did a lot of the engraving and the, uh, she found the German prisoners of war to be uh, uh, very compliant uh, with her instructions. Well, we actually have one of our uh, comments here that said, um, actually, her dad was an ambulance driver and a medic with the International Red Cross in France. So although we don't have it, apparently men did help out with that. So thank you from our audience to share that one. Um, do did Red Cross volunteers have to be single? Could they be married women? I know. She didn't address marital status. It probably would have preferred uh, single people. Yeah. I guess if you potentially were married and didn't have a family, maybe. I would say if, if they might have, uh, if a woman, if her husband, say, was in the service and she would then wish to volunteer. They probably would not object to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right.
right, let's see. So let's go, I'm gonna finish up some of the Red Cross questions, then we're gonna get on to Mary. Um, anybody know, Bob, maybe this one might be more to you, any Red Cross workers targeted during the war? Well, Red Cross um, hospitals always had the, the Red Cross emblems on them. Mm -hmm. uh, even, even the military medics uh, would have that, although in some cases uh, they felt that the, it was making a good target for the enemy to shoot at. Uh, that's out on the battlefield. It was, it was against the Geneva Conventions. It wasn't supposed to be done. I don't think they would have targeted Red Cross workers as such individually, uh, but there's always the possibilities of collateral damage. Uh, and being in areas that are uh, under bombardment, cities. Uh, so that, that is probably a big part of the explaining those 86 who were killed. Right. One person did comment, they must have checked. You can be married and be part of the Red Cross. There you go. Okay. All right, so let's go on to some specific Mary questions now. Um, do you, in any of the readings, did you see that she became close with any particular patients, that she came like long-term friends with maybe some of them? I don't recall her mentioning that specifically, but she did kind of attach a familial um, status to a lot of them saying that she was really serving as a sister or an aunt or a mother kind of figure to them, but she never mentions any of the patients by name to my knowledge. No, she, she makes reference, I think, to some really at the beginning of her memoir and saying that she had kept uh, in contact with a few and the, actually some of them were living in central Pennsylvania and that she would see them from time to time. But no, she never uh, mentioned names of anybody. So a little bit on the uniform was the design or the materials used for her uniforms in uh, intended for a particular climate or activity? So we have like the differentiation between the summer and winter uniform. Summer ones obviously being made of lighter material like the North Africa dress is seersucker. It's very lightweight, um, easily laundered. And the heavier woolen suit like she wears in France is designed for the colder climates for sure. So um, Mary, so did she, um, how did she get into the artist? Did she have any background in uh, artwork or manufacturing or crafts like that might have given her this knowledge? I tried to find out exactly what she taught prior to joining the Red Cross, but I couldn't get like a good answer on that. But I do know that a couple of her relatives um, were dye chemists. So she talks a, about an aunt of hers that was sending her hanks of yarn that were like discards from the dye factory that she worked at. And I think her father worked at the same place. Um, so there does appear to be kind of a family connection to crafts, but I honestly, she didn't say how she became so proficient at you know directing these kind of crafting activities and i wish she kind of addressed that more mm -hmm. yeah did uh she have any particular station or uh location that she preferred over another um definitely her tone is enjoying the algiers camp the most i mean obviously like she's not quite into the war yet at that point it's kind of like a lark in a way where they're on the edge of a desert. There's a lot of um, culture surrounding her that she's definitely not familiar with. So her tone definitely changes to really having to scrounge for supplies. She's seeing the damage left by the war, such as um, children who were being cared for that had missing limbs, for example, or I remember her saying about she could see at some of the um, aristocratic French households would take in elderly Jewish people to spare them from um, the persecution of Jews in that period as well. So I think that 
I would say she preferred North Africa the most because that's where she kind of had the most, um, I don't know how to say it. It, it wasn't really the atrocities of war there. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of her work, she didn't say what she had a preference in doing um, because she said her work was varied and that suited her. Well, I think we got through all the questions. We have some great questions in there. Um, this is recorded and um, we will be editing. We do a couple little few things and sometime midweek, we'll be sending this out to anybody who is on our email list. Also, if you think of a question after the fact, uh, use those emails to send it back. I can pass it on to Bob and Katie and they can answer those later. So thank you both for joining me today for Learn at Lunchtime. It's always great to pull out some objects from our collection and learn a little bit more about them. You know, use that link uh, and also those emails to search out uh, Mary's collection and maybe some other items that we have from our uh, military collection. So thank you, everybody, and uh, have a great weekend.